Thank you, Cole Bergs, for reading God's Word and praying, bringing us to the throne of grace. Uh, I've missed y'all. My family and I have missed y'all. We were not able to be here on Christmas Eve, and we were not able to be here last week due to COVID, but we're all in the clear, at least for now. Who knows what the future may hold? But nonetheless, we are glad that we get to be before you. Um, It is a beautiful new year, and yet though we thought we were going to be able to turn the page on the calendar and our masks would magically disappear, here we are still needing to be masked up and continuing on uh, in this journey, right? So speaking of journeys, if you've not been with us, or maybe you have and you've just forgotten where we were before Advent, um, we pick back up now on where we were. And where we were was in Matthew 5, during the Sermon on the Mount, Um, really what we have called the gospel of the kingdom. And to catch everyone up, truly, this is Jesus' vision for for his people and his kingdom. Um, Are we totally done with live stream? Are y'all looking at me like... Okay, all right, well, that doesn't matter for us in here. Nonetheless, we're sorry for them, uh, but here we are, right? Okay, so, uh, all right, so look, this is Jesus' vision for his people. Jesus' vision for his followers to flourish... Um, according to his design and inside of his kingdom. So when you start thinking about what is the blessed life, what is the good life, um, I don't know about you, but we're in a season of reflection. We're in a season of evaluation. We're in a season of putting before ourselves new disciplines, new new intentions, um, new whatever, whatever it may have be to, to accomplish a purpose that you didn't see happen in 21. And so it's a great time really to be reflective Um, It's a great time for us to evaluate what kind of life is it that God is calling us to live? What kind of life is a blessed life? What is worthy of pursuit and of calling and of sacrifice and of discipline? And so it's great that the Sermon on the Mount has kind of straddled this year um, as we move into 21. Because again, we will be invited into the kind of life that Jesus has for us, not necessarily the life that we may have built on our own without these instructions. To remind you, here we are. We are in the final of six statements that start with, you have heard it said, but I tell you. So you've heard it said, do not, uh, uh, do not murder, but I tell you, do not be angry. You have heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you, do not lust. And in the midst of all of this, what we have today is what we're calling enemy love. Enemy love, it's love for your enemy. And so what does that look like? Why is God calling us to live in such a way? But as we run through these six, you have heard it said, but I tell you statements, it's very important for us to realize this is not a new law that Jesus is setting up for us. He's not saying, um, you have heard it said, do not not, uh, uh, commit murder, but I tell you also, uh, don't be angry. And so therefore, if you do both of these things, you'll uh, you'll get into the kingdom of heaven. Instead, he's saying, look, We're all in a deep deficit before God. If the law says this, your heart truly is crying out for this. And if our hearts are in this deep of sin, we're all in trouble. We need a righteousness that goes beyond that of the Pharisees. And, of course, he calls us to that in chapter 5. And that's where we are, right? We're in this, this beautiful sermon inviting us to think about a different game altogether, not the law of Moses, but what does it look like to flourish inside of the kingdom? Because after all, if he's not about our law, then he must not be about external religious things. He's not about things like attendance or giving only. Instead, he wants our whole heart, he wants our whole lives to be captured by him. This is why we just read and why there was this big exhale at the end of verse 48, right? Of Therefore, you must be perfect perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's a vision statement by Jesus for all of his people to say you must be perfect to enjoy and to get in and to to, to thrive in this kingdom. Perfection is required. But if you looked at the language, it's a future tense verb. So what he's really saying is, and you shall be made perfect. It's a call to, for all of us and a vision for all of us, but there's also provision and promise right there in the Scripture that he's calling for all of us for perfection, for wholeness, for whole maturity, for our whole self to be just like the Father. Not just our externals, but our internals as well. 
All right, so as we turn the page into this new year, again, this season of reflection on what you want to change, on the things that you want to do differently in this new year, I want to ask you this question. Uh, I think it's helpful for us. What do you think God would change about the church in America in 2021? What do you think that God would change about the church in America in 2021? You see, I think there's this invitation for us today, if we would grasp hold of it, uh, to really think about these types of things. Because this is the deal, right? Jesus' challenge is going to be uh, what it was in verses 46 and 47. So let me read that to uh, help us remember what we just read, 46 and 47. Look at the challenge and the invitation by Jesus here as we get going. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Not even, do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. And so inside of this last, you have heard it said, but I tell you statement and teaching and clarification by Jesus are two questions that I think are very pertinent for the church in America today. What reward are you living for and what more are you doing than everybody else around you? And that's not like what more in quantity. The story here is that, man, are you living just like a tax collector, a penny pincher with love? Or and just like a Gentile, which is to say an outsider out of God's kingdom? Are we living just like everyone else? Because if you look at the church in 2020, were we different? Were our social media habits any different? Were our problems any different? Were our solutions any different? Um, where are we truly in this state, in this crazy time that we find ourselves in? And then Jesus is asking us, what, how is it that we're living? Is it any different than those around us? Is it any different? Is it any more? No, these two questions should drive us towards uncommon living, uncommon leading, and uncommon loving. You see, oftentimes instead of living as followers and therefore flourishers of the king inside of his kingdom, we do live as tax collectors. We live as if we're penny-pinching with love, as if we're going to run out of this resource of God's kindness, or perhaps we're only living out of our own kindness. We live as outsiders as if we have not been given the privilege of a seat at the table for the king. We live in such a way where we forget these, uh, these types of privileges that God has given us. And instead, God is inviting us to something more, something different than everyone else in the world. So what are the invitations? Well, first, I want us to understand this, that neighbor love is common, the kind of love that God is calling us to um, is beyond neighbor love, but we oftentimes focus most on loving your neighbor. Do we not? we got to love God and love your neighbor. These are the two greatest commandments. That's what Jesus said, that the summation of the law and the prophets is to love your God and to love your neighbor. And those two things are very good. But may I say that this is a baseline of righteousness. This is a baseline of someone who would follow God. Anybody that says they could follow God are going to love God, whoever God that God is, and love their neighbor. They're going to be kind. This is what was written in the law. So let's read first Matthew 5, 43, to understand Jesus' baseline, the, 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 the main law from which he is going to draw upon as we go forward. 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So Jesus here is drawing from a, an Old Testament law, but then he's also drawing from common practice. It is never written in the Old Testament to, love, to hate your enemy. It's not in the Old Testament at all. So what is Jesus doing? Instead, he is pulling from Old Testament law and common practice to say, like, this is how you guys live. So this is what he's pulling from. He's pulling from Leviticus 19.18, which we're all going to do our quiet time in this week. I know that you're not there in your reading plan yet, but it will come, what, say, February or March, and then you're going to fall off of that reading plan and wonder when the next one starts. It's next January, actually. But nonetheless, Leviticus 19 will be here, right? You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. 
is what Leviticus 19 says. So right there in the Old Testament law is this, uh, is this common understanding of loving other people, of loving your neighbor. The first half of Jesus' is saying is here. But the last half is a broad application of many Old Testament scriptures, one such as Psalm 139, verses 21 and 22, which is going to come up on your screen, which says this, like this is how you get to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Because this is in the scriptures in Psalm 139. Do I not hate those who hate you? He's praying now unto the Lord. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. You ever go to God in prayer with that as your justification that he should answer you? I hate all the people you hate, Lord. <laughs> As if he's going to go, oh, okay, well, now I'm going to answer your prayers. Now I'll give you what you want. No, that's not something that we normally do, but there it is in the scriptures, right? That is certainly a thing that they were drawing upon to say, I hate all the people that you hate, God. All your enemies, I've sworn as my enemies. And so it's no wonder that Jesus comes onto the scene and says, your baseline of righteousness, of the, what the Pharisees would teach of love your neighbor and hate your enemy is fine, but it's not sufficient. It's not the way in which we actually flourish inside of God's kingdom. If that's true, what does that say about how you love? If that's true, what does that say about how you form friendships and who you pray for? If that's just a basic common decency and a basic common law, even from the Old Testament, what does that say about how we're actually living and loving others? Do we love our enemies or do we stop at trying to love our neighbor? Maybe our neighbor is our enemy, or we've deemed them that. That is, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll clear that up here in just a little bit, right? But the summation of the Pharisaical teaching then was to take care of our own and shun whoever is an outsider. If you're an outsider, you're not welcome here. We're going to take care of our own. We're number one. They are not welcome for anyone that would be outsiders. For Christians, we emphasize loving your neighbor, but we never really talk about loving your enemy. Loving your neighbor through common acts of kindness is no different than common kindness that the world can give. You see this all throughout uh, coronavirus time, don't you? Don't you see common kindness such as food banks and shelters and, 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 and things like this? That's a common kindness that anyone can give. And I'm not saying don't do those things, but instead Jesus is saying if we're going to flourish in the kingdom, that's baseline stuff. We shouldn't even count that as a win. That should be just automatic, assumptive. Instead, there's a different priority in the kingdom if we're going to flourish, and that is loving our enemy. You see, though neighbor love is common love, enemy love is kingdom love. It's what kind of love exists in the kingdom and should be, granted, should be common or as common as neighbor love. So let's just read this in verse 44. I love what Jesus does here. He's going to explain this for us in a very fascinating way. So let's just track with him on what he's up to. So, but I say to you, right, so you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And verse 44 comes along and he says this, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, I want you to just note this. Jesus' command is not just to love your neighbor by offering them dinner or to love the stranger by going to a food drive or to post something on Facebook so that someone can disagree with you and unfollow you, not that that ever happens, but that's part of the real deal that we're in. This is a call to kingdom love, to the kind of love which becomes normal. Now, why do I say that this kind of enemy love is something that can be and should be normal in the kingdom? Um, truly for us, uh, this is truly an, an invitation for us because of verse 45. Verse 44 tells us that enemy love, that love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that's God's command for us. But why is that God's command? Because of verse 45. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Why? Because he makes his son, I love that it says his son. He makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. This is what is known as common grace. When God like sends rain, 
um, on your neighbor's house who are non-believers or quote-unquote evil or unjust, when he sends rain on your yard and the yard of someone else that does not believe in Jesus. Or if you were a farmer, this would really matter. We're not farmers. But if we were farmers, this, this passage right here would open up our eyes to what is known as common grace, that my, my crops flourish along with my neighbor's crops, which also flourish. My crops don't flourish. There's a drought just like my neighbor's crops don't flourish if there's a drought. That there's a common grace and a common provision for all of humanity. If there was one person who could withhold his goodness and his provision from evil people, it would be God. But he doesn't. In which we say, we should say, praise be to God for that. That he does not withhold his mercy and his kindness and his provision for those who were once evil or who sometimes practice evil or who have uh, evil thoughts in our own hearts. Thank God that it's not meritorious. Thank God that it's not a scores-keeping system with the Lord. Because if it was, we would all be in a drought 24-7. But instead, God reigns on the just and on the unjust, the evil and the good. Why is it that he does that? Because he knows that though they are in active rebellion against him, he has compassion on them. He has mercy on them. He knows that they are ultimately, he wants to win them over with his love so that they will hopefully understand his grace because he knows that they are ultimately being duped by his ultimate enemy, Satan himself. He is the one that is blinding their sight. He is the one that they are, they are blinded by, that they cannot see his goodness, his provision. And he knows that they're not, he's not going to win them over by ignoring them or not providing for them, but instead through kindness, through basic and common grace of provision. I wonder if this is how we relate. I wonder what excuses we make to withhold love from our enemies. And I'm going to tell you right now, like, y'all know me well enough. My personality is one that I'll make, I'll make an enemy on accident. I don't mean to, but I just do. Um, like as an Enneagram 8, I don't know if you're into the Enneagram, but I'm just an 8, so that means I'm a challenger. And some of you that know me are smiling and laughing, and some of you that don't know anything about that, they're like, I don't know what that is, but maybe we should find more out about that so that I don't want to hate you so much. But that's fine, right? But like as, that, as my personality, like I can, I can make an enemy, quote, unquote, by accident. And, and like what I know is that through these types of passages, I can make all sorts of excuses to not love those that misunderstand me, to not love those that cut me out, to not pray for those that may gossip or slander or whatever about me. We can make all kinds of excuses not to be able to act like God would act. He, of all the people, he would have excuses not to provide in such a common way. But look at what he says. Pray for those who are your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Why? Because your Father, who is in heaven, cares for all people in such a way that it should be like this. It should be so common that the next time you see it rain on your neighbor's house, on their yard, and it doesn't stay dry over there, even though you know they reject Jesus, that's the kind of love with which God is reminding you to love them. Though they may reject you, though they may cause harm to you, though they may intend evil upon you, God is calling us to live in such a way that like, when it rains, we remind ourselves that's the kind of love with which we love our enemy. It should be common in the kingdom, but it is far off for many of us, including me. I make too many excuses, right? I make excuses of the depth of the wound, of the length of time that it has hurt me. Um, I forget that, that those people have been duped by Satan himself, and I tend to focus on how wrong they are and how right, of course, I am. I don't know if anybody else is like this, but I tend to just you know, downplay my own faults and upplay yours. Oh, well, I mean, you did all these things against me, but me, oh, I just, you know, hey, it's just a little bitty thing. Enemy love shows the world that we belong to our Father. Isn't that what it says? That this is how God commonly loves all people, that without the grace of God, we are all his enemy, and he has always sent his reign upon the earth, which is a good thing, a good thing in the Bible that is a sign of his blessing. And so since he loves in such this way, how much more, it says in verse 45, the first part, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Not so that we may become his sons and daughters, but that we would represent him on the earth. We would represent him here 
I don't know about you, but like some of my favorite um, commercials these days are the Geico commercials. Um, I don't have cable, so I don't just get to fast forward stuff. I have to suffer through all of like the prescription commercials and all the Geico commercials. Anybody still not have cable and just cut the, yeah, okay, yeah, come on with me now. Like these Geico commercials are good though, right? Um, We can't protect you from becoming your parents, but we can protect your house because of this, this, and this. Like this is what happens, right? When you have young kids, they go out into the yard with you and they get their their, their play mower and they follow you through the yard with their play mower. Um, when they, or, or if it's female, you, you may be doing your nails and your little daughter wants to do her nails. And so they imitate you. They follow you in such a way. But see, what hits home with that Geico commercial is that one day you walk by the mirror and you go, whoa, was my dad here? Nope. No, it was just me. Oh, dang. Okay, I actually did become him. I didn't mean to. It wasn't on purpose. It just happened. And whether I like it or realize it or not, you just are there, and he's there, and I'm okay. We're doing this thing. We become our parents, whether we like it or not, through genetics, but what God is calling us through the spiritual realm is to make sure that we imitate our father in such a way that his kind of love flows through his sons and his daughters. This is not just in Matthew 5. It's also in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5. It says this in 431. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander, love how Paul writes, he would would totally flunk out of English. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along, because I wasn't done, along with all malice, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Why? As God and Christ forgave you. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Imitate him. Become like him. That when you walk into the mirror, you don't see your dad. You see your father in heaven. You see somebody, somebody that's, that's looking more and more like Jesus again and again in our souls. And walk in love. Walk in this love. Don't just make it one time thing. Make it a practice. Love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. What does that have to do with loving your enemy? Because God is calling all of us to remember that we were once his enemies. That's what Heather prayed. That's what's true in the scriptures. We were once running. We were once rebellious. We were once resentful and in many ways still are. And yet God came and has not and will not give up on his love for us. It is a relentless love and a relentless pursuit of sinners. You see, this is absolutely one of the hardest commandments in the entire New Testament to love and pray for your enemy, for your persecutor. The reason why I know it's so difficult is because if you think about this as a continuum of relationships, it's on the furthest side of the continuum from where you stand. So if you think about this, and you could probably fill in more than these, count how many levels I go to before I get to persecutor, okay? I think I have them written down, but here we go. Like, I'm going to love myself, I'm going to love my spouse, I'm going to love my children, I'm going to love my extended family. I'm going to love my best friend. Look at, you see the order in which we usually prefer people. I'm going to love my best friend. And then I'm going to love a friend. And then I'm going to love an acquaintance. And then I'm going to love a stranger. And then someone who's annoying. Like, they're not a stranger. They just annoy you. You don't have those people? I am one of those people? Okay, good. Uh, And then we'll go to the ex-friend. Yes, okay, perfect. Um, The accidental offender. This is the accident. So it's not an ex-friend that like did something. Maybe they, what, for whatever reason, they're in and out through seasons. Um, this is now an accidental offender. They just, uh, they offended you by accident. <clears throat> now someone who's different, they're just different than you. Not just, you know, mm. Then there's the purposeful offender. The one that, who did something to you and they did it on purpose and you know it. And they said that, yeah, it's just purposeful. And then there's the wounding person. And I'm not talking about like faithful wounds of a friend. I'm talking about just one that just, just can't help but to wound you. Maybe it's a, 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 your dad or your mom or just someone else. There's a wounding person. Then there's someone who's hostile against you. Just whatever you say, they take the opposite. I'm not talking about our children. <laughs> then there's the enemy. And then there's the persecutor. So how many, how many steps away are we from those that we would prefer? We're 16, 17 steps of preferences away that Jesus is calling us to love someone that far away from our preferences. 
So can you see, going into this new year, that 2021 must be different in how we love and relate with people because Jesus commands that the kind of love which should be as common as rain on evil people is the kind of love that is absolutely beyond your preferences, absolutely beyond what you desire, absolutely beyond what's convenient. That's why he started this section in, when, when he says, hey, if, someone, if you know that someone has something against you, lay your gift at the altar and go settle accounts quickly. It's the same thing, that there's a persecutor out there, someone who intends harm on you, not someone who accidentally harms you, an intention of harm, an intention of woundedness. They want to injure you. It's that person that God says, love them. And how is it that we love them? Well, it doesn't end with this, but it certainly starts with this. Pray for them. Pray for those who persecute you. See, this kind of love is not common in the world. It will shake the world up but it should be somewhat common in the kingdom. You see, God does not ration his kindness. He sends love on everyone. And so I'm wondering, how can we, how can I do the same in 21? How can I imitate my father, my my father? My father, how can I imitate him for this kind of love will truly shake the world? If you don't know this, our country has been in a bit of unrest over this year for all kinds of reasons, political unrest, Um, uh, unrest around the truth, around viruses and masks and all those sorts of things, but it certainly would include um, racial injustice and the unrest that has come with that. And so you see things like what I remembered when I was preparing for this week, like Botham Jean. Do you guys remember Botham Jean? We should remember that name. He uh, He was a minister. He was a worship pastor. He lived in Dallas. And you remember this story now a little bit, that he was at home, and he was uh, minding his own business in his own apartment, and young Amber Geiger um, went into the wrong apartment, thought it was her apartment, it was actually Botham Jean's apartment, and she got scared, and she killed him. And there was outrage. It was in the midst of so, I mean, it's been in the midst of so much injustice, so much difficulty in this country around racial injustices. And there was outrage over this, that she should be, you know, the, the, the book should be thrown at her and this and that. She went, she got convicted of murder. She was fired beyond all the things. And at her sentencing, what happened? Do you remember this? Do you remember seeing this? This is enemy love. This is the kind of love with which God loves us, us. When Botham Jean's brother, Brant Jean, used his time on the stand during a victim impact statement to show the kind of love God shows us. So just to give you a little bit of a taste to quote this, he says this, I forgive you. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you, if, you, if you kept up with this story at all, he got so much flack for this. The African-American judge who allowed him to hug his brother's murderer got so much flack for this because it shakes the world when you love in such a way that's totally uncommon, when you love your enemy, so to speak. But he, he sees her, and he knows that she's actually not his enemy. Hate is his enemy. Death is his enemy. Satan is his enemy, which is why he can look at her and say this to her, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. I love you, he says. And I'm not going to say that I hope you rot. How many times have you read or or seen witness impact statements where they just go after their offender? They go after the person that killed their loved one. But no, not this man. I want the best for you. I'm not going to say that I hope you rot and die, but I personally want the best for you. I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you, he says, and this is what he says next. And the best for you would be for you to give your life to Christ. And what an unbelievable statement of the kind of love with which God has loved us and now commands and calls his people who would flourish inside of the the kingdom of God to be able to love in such a way that I'll, I'll bet you none of our brothers were killed unjustly as he sat in his apartment, and yet we will find ways to condemn our brother and our sister in the faith for the slightest of wound, for the slightest of little mistaken uh, uh, offense. And yet God is saying, no, no, that is not the way of the kingdom of God. That is not how I do things. That's not how I've loved you. So how then will you love your brother, your sister, the stranger, the neighbor, the enemy? You go down that continuum of relationships all the way to your persecutor, the one who definitely intends harm on you. 
That's the one he's calling to love. So then how much more all these other people from here to there? That's why this is absolutely one of the most challenging commands in the New Testament. Because it calls us out of ourselves. It calls us to rely on someone else besides ourselves. It calls us to see beyond what our preferences are or what might happen next. Because that person could hurt you again. He's not calling you to to a life of abuse, so don't go there. Instead, he's calling you to a life of self-sacrifice. Agape your enemy. Love your enemy. Lay down your rights for the sake of another. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for them. What would this world look like if we loved our enemy like God loved us? What would the American church look like if if we quit getting into battles that are not ours, such as political battles or anything else? Those are not our battles. Those are, those are battles for politicians. Instead, our battles are for good and evil to pursue what God wants us to pursue. What would our political landscape, our social media feeds, our church, our world look like if we prayed for those who intended harm on us? If we loved those, if we laid down our rights for those who are different than us, who offend us, and pursued their best interests by doing something like Brant Jean did. You know what you need is the best for you would be to give your life to Christ, would be to repent and believe in the good news. And I'm going to do the same. That would be what would be best. What would it look like for us to live with this sort of ethic if we overlooked the offenses that come our way, not calling one another enemies, but relating like true brothers and sisters who will share the same table for all of eternity? I don't know about you, but I find these types of passages quite troubling. Uh, Like my soul just gets agitated thinking about, like, how do I actually do this? What do I do and how do I do this? And I'm not big on prescribing, like, a list of ways to do this, but I'm going to do that today. Um, I usually just kind of try to give that uh, over to the Spirit and have him teach you. But I want to just kind of give you five steps and I'm not saying they're in, in order. Take these for whatever order works for, for you. But really, truly, how can we love our enemy? Number one, first, remember that you were once God's enemy. If you have forgotten that, remember who you were as you read Romans 1, 18 through 30, whatever it is, 31 or 32. Remember that you were those people that exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Remember in Romans 3 that you are the one, that no one is good. No, not even one. You have all gone your own way. Remember remember in Colossians 1, which we talked about a few weeks ago, that you were hostile. You were God's enemy before he came for you. Remember that that's who you were, and yet God looks at our status. He looks at who we once were, and he says, I love you anyways. While we were still enemies, Romans 5, Christ died for us. So it's no wonder that he says, like, if if you're going to love the way he loved, then we've got to remember how he once loved us. Colossians 3, 13, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Remember, again, this gospel-centered life is to remember how God has loved us so that we can love another. First, remember we were once God's enemies. Second, Love the way that God loved you. He loves you without any expectation of love in return. He doesn't love you to get love back. He does not need your love. He's got enough love within the Trinity. Father loving Son, Son loving Spirit, Spirit loving Father, and on and on and on it goes. He does not need our love. He loves us because God in his nature is love. It's an expression of who he is, and for us, we are to take on that character who love people for free. We love the way God loved us. Third, we are slow to, la- to label others your enemy. Be slow to label others your enemy. So here's two people that are not your enemy. You ready? Christians, I know that they may hurt you the worst. I know that you may think to yourself, well, they should know better. They have the Holy Spirit. So should, so should we. When we offend the Lord, when we, when we do, when we, we purposefully sin against our God, we know better too. Christians are not your enemy. Instead, they're going to sit next to you at the banquet table of the king for all of eternity. Like, how would it be to get to, to heaven and be like, okay, my assigned seat is next to you. Perfect. For all time. Right? They're not your enemy. They're going to be there with you. 
So if it's a fellow Christian that you're labeling as your enemy, they're not your enemy. So that's, number, that's one person that's not your enemy. The other person who's not your enemy is someone who agitates you. So I've used this analogy before. Um, we still have one of the old Maytag um, like top load uh, laundry machines, whatever they're called, washing machines. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah, you feel me right here. Come on up top. Uh, we don't have the front loader because ours hasn't broken yet, and we don't, we're gonna, just going to keep fixing it, right? So instead, when you load stuff in there, what's the thing in the middle? What's it called? The agitator. What does the agitator do? Makes you clean. Makes the clothes clean. Sometimes we have an agitation in our lives. Those people that want your good, I'm not talking about everybody because not everybody wants your good. The people that want your good but that will consistently call you to what's best for you, Maybe your maybe your pastor, maybe your maybe your family discipleship pastor, maybe your elders, maybe your neighborhood group leader, those people that have your ultimate good in mind, but won't settle for you uh, to do something outside of what God has prescribed for you. Instead, they'll go, hey, hey, so we've noticed, but God is saying. Those types of people, that's the agitator in the washing machine, just trying to, try, they have your good in mind. That also is not your enemy, though they may frustrate you. That person is also not your enemy. Like an addict who is being pulled into an intervention, we need people who will tough love us away from our addiction to ourselves, to our comforts, to our preferences. That's what Jesus was to his disciples. That's what Jesus was to the people that are listening to the Sermon on the Mount, saying, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And they're all going, no. And he's going, yeah, if you want to flourish in the kingdom, that's the kind of love with which I have loved you with which you are called to love them. That was number three. Let's go through them one more time. Hang on, we're almost done. One, remember you were once God's enemy. Two, love the way that God loved you. Three, be slow to label others your enemy. Four, realize everyone is in a spiritual battle. If you realize that someone else is battling against the enemy, against Satan himself, surely you can have mercy on them because you too are in that battle with them. Ephesians 6 says this, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That other person is not your ultimate enemy. That's why God can reign on the just and on the unjust, because that person is not his ultimate enemy. The ultimate enemy is sin and death and the devil. And everyone is in this spiritual battle. Fifth and finally is exactly what Jesus said to do. Pray for them. Pray for them. What happens when we pray? We are reminded, it says in verse 48, excuse me. It, we are reminded in verse 45 that we have a Father who is in heaven. We are reminded in verse 48 that we have a Father who is in heaven. We're reminded when we pray, right, that we are reminded that we have the love of our Father who is near to us and His Son Jesus and humbled because the Father who is in heaven and reigns and rules above us. So when we pray, we are right-sized before our Creator and the sustainer of all people. And if God has not exacted vengeance on our enemy, then surely we must not either. Instead, for us, when we pray for our persecutors, what we are saying is that we have no power to change that person. What we are saying is that we are reminded by our Father in heaven that we too would be at his enemy if not for his intervention and grace and overlooking offense in our own hearts. So that when we pray, we are reminded, Lord, help them be reminded of your love for them that I also may forgive them as you have forgiven me. And a great prayer to wrap it all up, something that we introduced many years ago during Lent, because there are many times we have a hard time discerning who's enemy and who's a friend. Lord, lead me into the truth about you. Lord, lead me into the truth about that other person. They're probably not my enemy. Lord, lead me into the truth about myself, that I'm a sinner yet saved by the grace of God, purposed to live and flourish in the kingdom that God has so richly provided for all of us. Let's pray. Our Father who is in heaven, we ask for the strength to obey. We ask for the Spirit to empower us. That the call is the same to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is imperfect. That we be made whole. That we're, we're, that's an admission that we're not whole. 
Remind us, O God, of your nearness to us. Remind us that in our failures to love our enemies, that you haven't quit loving us, that this isn't performance-based. This isn't about, oh, well, I'm, I need some things from God in this new year, so I guess I better go find some enemies to love them in this way. No. Instead, Lord, we are loved for free. You didn't love us for yourself. You loved us for us. Lord, thank you for seeing rebellious people. Thank you for seeing sinners, rebels, enemies, those who are running in the opposite direction and yet not losing your desire to come after us. That you showed your love for us, that while we were sinners, enemies, rebels, you died for us. And so, Lord, let that change our hearts let that, let that change our minds. Let that cause us to repent and believe such beautiful good news. For the Bible says, for if while we were your enemies, we were reconciled to God by, death of, by the death of his son, how much more are now are we reconciled? Shall we be saved by his life? And more than that, we also rejoice. So, Lord, let us rejoice. Let us trust. Let us repent where necessary. And let us respond um, in the gospel, through communion now as the family of God. May we be a people who are marked by this type of enemy love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.